We're standing here today in front of Australia's parliament at the beginning of a new parliament in a new government and we have hope for the first time that this pursuit to the death of an Australian citizen will stop. We're here to ask the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, to intervene in this pursuit of an Australian publisher for publishing the truth about US war crimes. Julian Assange faces imminent extradition and an effective death sentence. His situation has become dire. His health has almost been completely destroyed by 11 years of relentless persecution, while his government has hidden behind the misuse of the law. Journalism is not espionage. Julian Assange is a political prisoner. You cannot bang on about press freedom and democracy while seeking to criminalise journalism. We're delighted today to have multiple members of the parliamentary Bring Julian Assange Home Group here with us. Amnesty Australia are also represented and Doctors for Assange as well as an individual whom you all know who has been a political prisoner himself. The Bring Assange Home Parliamentary Group now is a representative of um, political parties across the spectrum. And I'd like to invite the first member to speak, and that is Andrew Wilkie. Andrew, the independent member for Clark in Tasmania, is one of the most highly respected politicians in the history of this country, really, for the principal stand he takes on every matter important to our nation. He's been a whistleblower himself, and he understands well the price that whistleblowers pay. And we're, we have owe him a great debt for getting together the parliamentary group and for expanding its ranks. Andrew Book. Thank you so much, Mary. When I talk in support of Julian Assange, I normally rail, rail at the government, this government, the United States government, the British government, about the terrible injustice being meted out to Julian. But today I'm going to quite deliberately take a more sombre, a more grounded approach to my, uh, to my three minutes I've been allocated. And that's just to set the scene. Now, I first met Julian at the Melbourne Writers' Festival in 2004 when I was uh, on a panel speaking about a, a little book I'd written about my own whistleblowing experience over the Iraq War. And after the, uh, the session, this youngish, good-looking, blonde-haired fellow came up to me. Uh, and I, as best I can remember, that, that's how I'd describe him a young, good-looking, keen fellow, and he, he picked my brains for a few minutes about how he might set up uh, some sort of safe mechanism for whistleblowers to ventilate uh, and publish the information they have. And we chatted for a little while, and then I, I forgot all about that. Until I visited Julian in Belmarsh Prison in February 2020, just as the pandemic was starting. And the man I saw in Belmarsh was not the man I had seen at the Melbourne Writers Festival. By that stage, he'd been in Belmarsh maybe 12 months, virtually all of it in solitary confinement, following, uh, I think, seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy. And he was already a broken, sick man. He did his best to put up a brave face, put on a brave face, but he wasn't entirely successful. I saw someone who clearly was suffering was the a victim of psychological torture and was at wit's end. No wonder the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils Melsner, uh, and some of you would be familiar with his recent book, has made it abundantly clear that in his expert opinion, Julian Assange has been subject in Belmarsh Prison to psychological torture. I can, I can only try and imagine what his state is now 
and hence the urgency, the absolute urgency for busting him out of Belmarsh as quickly as humanly possible. So I take this opportunity one more time to call on the Australian government to urgently intervene and to fix this. Now I have a lot of respect for Anthony Albanese and I'm mindful that he said that recently that some things should not be handled with a megaphone. But frankly we have given this government a fair bit of time now and there seems to be no, uh, no uh, progress on getting him out. Now I know, I know Albo has got to manage mixed feelings within the Labor Party and among the left about Julian but I take this opportunity to say to Anthony again, when you boil it all down, this is all about a Walkley Award winning Australian journalist who published hard evidence of US war crimes and in response the US wants to get even and so, uh, so long the UK and Australia have been happy to go along for the ride because they've put their bilateral relationships with Washington ahead of the rights of a, a, a decent man, a hero not a villain, uh, and that is just plain wrong. Please maintain the rage, keep the pressure on the new government. If we keep the pressure up, then I am confident that eventually justice will prevail for Julian. Thank you very much, Andrew. We're going to try and move on uh, quickly because they obviously have very important work to do in there. The fact that they are here is a demonstration of how important they feel this issue is. I'd like to now call on Bridget Archer to please come forward. Bridget made the nation's heart sing when she crossed the floor on an emissions target and on an Australian Integrity Commission. The fact that she's here supporting the release of Julian Assange uh, is an indication of her support for press freedom and we're thrilled that she's here. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, my remarks will be brief because to me it is a simple proposition. I joined the federal bipartisan Bring Julian Assange Home Parliamentary Group due to my ongoing concerns about the treatment he has endured over the past decade. There may be a range of views about the actions of Mr Assange and WikiLeaks, which can be debated, but at the end of the day, it's not the point. When an Australian is in trouble overseas, whatever the reason may be, it is the duty of our government to help them. It is not for us to sit in judgment. This is a question of mercy and compassion for an Australian citizen who has endured inhumane conditions and has suffered significant mental and physical challenges as a result of his ongoing incarceration due to this protracted battle. He has not been convicted of a crime, but has already served a lengthy sentence. I echo the words of fellow parliamentary group member, Labor MP Julian Hill, who has said, there can never be a legal solution to this case. It is inherently political. We have previously managed to secure the safe return of Australian citizens under difficult diplomatic circumstances. And we have a responsibility to do the same for Mr Assange. I called on the previous government to bring Mr Assange home and I call on the new government to do the same. Thank you, Bridget. Please don't, don't go, Bridget. I'm going to ask you to do the honours. Um, if you could just stand by here. And Christian from Amnesty International, um, before our politicians start to head back up the hill, you're right, you're right. we are going to have a symbolic release of, of Julian. Uh, many years ago, Julian Assange said that if wars can be started with lies, then peace can be started with the truth. The dove is the symbol of peace, justice and freedom. Our dove represents press freedom. Our dove is Julian Assange. And we call on the Prime Minister to bring Julian home. Make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd
I'd like to now call on um, Monique Ryan, the member for Kuyong. Now, there was so much to admire about Monique during uh, the election campaign and straight after she was elected, straight after she deposed the sitting treasurer, um, <laughs> Monique tweeted to Andrew Wilkie re with regard to Julian Assange, what can I do to help? Thank you, Monique. Thank you, Mary, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, it, it's a testament to the power of community, I think. I gave my first speech in Parliament this morning, and what I spoke to was the fact that I was there because of the work of a community that came together to speak truth to power, which is what you're all doing today in your own way. I'm a doctor and I care about the health of Australians. I've seen what has happened with Julian Assange in the last 10 years, and I, I echo what Andrew and Bridget have said. He's an award-winning journalist who's been convicted of no crime, and I think we all know that he would not be in this position were it another sovereign power that was seeking to take him from the United Kingdom. So as a member of a new wave of politicians that are really standing on the shoulders of the people who've come before us, I think I can speak for many of my colleagues in Parliament, in this new Parliament, that we hope that we can make a constructive contribution to, to your cause and to the cause of all Australians who try to speak truth to power. We all believe in a free media, well, most of us. <laughs> we all believe in, in justice. I think we all believe in honesty, and I'm very uh, privileged to be able to speak to you today and, and grateful for that opportunity, and I pledge on behalf of myself, but also other members of the 47th Parliament, to do our very best to convince the government to bring Julian home. Thank you, Monique. Um, I'd now like to call on the Senator from Western Australia, Jordan Steele-John. Jordan's a remarkable individual, a great advocate uh, for disability, but also uh, for climate action. He was the youngest senator to, to uh, join the Australian Parliament at the age of 23. Thank you so much and let me begin uh, today by acknowledging first of all uh, the owners of the land upon which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty over this land was never ceded. Julian Assange today should be a free man. He is a publisher, his organisation WikiLeaks obtains and publishes freely information that it obtains. The literal definition of journalism. It happens every day in new newsrooms across uh, the continent. It is a key pillar of democracy. What he and WikiLeaks uh, undertook uh, was to expose horrendous war crimes covered up and concealed by the United States and for that he has been pursued he has been persecuted he has been imprisoned he is now being tortured tortured for exposing such crimes the current president and then vice president Joe Biden admitted that the persecution and prosecution of Julian Assange was basically because he had embarrassed the United States. Imagine that. Imagine being found to have killed civilians in cold blood, covered it up, and then attempting, attempting then to imprison the person that exposed those crimes. How perverse, how morally bankrupt Shame. 
Now, our Australian government, in response to the persecution of this individual and his organisation, has offered for more than a decade now platitudes. They've spoken about passive consular assistance, as though Julian was an Australian overseas that had simply lost his passport. Lost his passport, got a bit lost somewhere overseas. Failing at every moment to recognise the reality that this is an Australian citizen who has been forced to flee and hide and was finally taken into the custody of complicit nations ad hoc to the United States and has been subjected, as the UN has spoken uh, so clearly, uh, to the psychological torture of detention. Now, at this very moment, Julian's life is at stake. Let us make no mistake. And democracy itself is at stake. The question before the Australian government now is will it prioritise, finally, after all this time, the liberty and human rights of an Australian citizen and in so doing send a clear message that Australia is a nation which will champion the freedom of the press, which will champion human rights, which will push back on the United States of America and call them out when they commit human rights abuses. Or will they once again remain silent and hide behind diplomatic protocols? That is the decision before the new parliament and the new government today. The Greens, along every step of the way, have been in solidarity uh, with Julian, supportive uh, of WikiLeaks. Um, and I'm very proud to be joined today by Senator Peter Wish Wilson, who has been a constant ally and advocate of Julian Assange and to build on the work of so many Greens MPs that have been uh, constant in their campaigning for his freedom and for his liberty. So we join here today, gathered uh, to advocate for the freedom of a fellow citizen whose bravery and courage should be celebrated in this nation, yeah. whose freedom and whose imprisonment is bound up with our own. As the dove flew free today, let Julian soon be free. Yeah. Let him go home to his family who love and who miss him dearly. Let him begin to heal from the scars and the wounds that have been inflicted upon him. Let us finally turn our attention to the prosecution, to the holding account of those who fired the bullets, who pulled the triggers, who covered up the crimes. Those are the ones who must be held to account now. Yeah. Every lever must be pulled. Every conversation must be had. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese must pick up the phone to the President of the United States and state clearly that it is the position of the Australian government that Julian Assange be free. And we will continue as a community together to campaign to organise across the continent until that moment comes. And when Julian is free and when he is home and healed, if he is so able and wants to enter that building behind me, then he will be welcomed yeah. by the community and by the Greens as an individual of courage. Yeah. A great Australian who, through his work, brought the sunlight of justice and the empowerment of truth to so many across the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jordan. I hope the Prime Minister's ears are burning. I'd now like to call on Peter, Senator Peter Wish Wilson, who's been integral to this campaign. He's been a strong supporter of Julian uh, from the beginning. And um, we 
There are few people that have made as big a contribution to this as Peter has. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mary. I would certainly like to acknowledge the contribution that you've made. Uh, and in fact, many of you here today, uh, same faces that I've seen for years at rallies, uh, the organisers of today, thank, a big thank you. Um, four years ago, Julian's dad, John Shipton, uh, came to visit myself and Andrew Wilkie in Parliament, and we were the only two MPs back then that would meet with him. And it's great to see, uh, following that, we set up the Friends of Julian Assange, uh, parliamentary friends of Bring Assange Home Group Group, and now we've got amazing representation, and it will continue to get better. So there is hope and there is optimism. Uh, I'm just gonna be quick today. Can I just get a, a show of hands? How many people marched against the unjust an illegal and catastrophic invasion of Iraq. Me too. I don't know if you're aware, but in just a few months time, we're gonna have the 20th anniversary of the first protests against that war leading into next year. And we know in our hearts, we were right to oppose that war. We were right, history has proven us right. It was a catastrophe. Millions have died. Millions had to flee the region. Instability, insurgency, violence. The world is a less safe place. It has been catastrophic. We were right. And one of the reasons we know we were right was Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, the great truth tellers of this war. And Julian is sitting in a prison cell while the real criminals have gone scot-free. Yeah. So th this is what I'm going to say to you today. Can we mobilise, like we did nearly 20 years ago, 33 million people around the planet marched against that war. Up to 2 million people on the streets of London. A million on the streets of Rome. Sydney at the time saw its biggest protest in history. Where are they all now for Julian Assange and for WikiLeaks? Where are they all now? They must in their hearts know that what Julian has done by telling the truth of this war was right and just. And they must help us seek justice. So let's work really hard in the next six months to get people out on the streets to march again because if we don't, if we let Julian Assange be extradited and he dies in a maximum security prison in the US, then this new war, this new front that is being run by dark powers in the US, we will get another war and another one. And we'll only have ourselves to blame if we don't come together again. So let's make sure in the next six months we get to the streets and we march for Julian, we march for his freedom, and we march for the legacy of press freedoms and make sure that they don't win the final front, and that is a front against press freedoms and truth-telling. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Now, before we proceed with our speakers today, I'd just like to acknowledge that what we've heard here today is very strong support among people up in, on the hill uh, for our Prime Minister to show some steel when he picks up the phone. It's not just a matter of asking and then accepting the excuses. President Biden has said he won't intervene in prosecutions. He, he's, he doesn't believe in political interference. Uh, he has <laughs> primaries uh, coming up and other things on his mind. However, the Australian Prime Minister has some very strong cards to play. We have been a very good friend of the United States. We have been a, a great supporter of all its uh, military adventures which have ended in disasters over the last 50 years. We are in a very good position to say if we are behind you because we have shared values, 
This is, this is the reason we're given for our alliance. Shared values and the defence of democracy. Well, you don't defend democracy by taking a stab at the heart of investigative journalism and completely undermine democracy. Yeah. 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 And if you do, then where are the shared values? Where are they? And why are we part of this alliance? This is a conversation nationally that we need to have. And we need to have our people up on the hill leading it. Um, I'd like to now continue with uh, a few words from Amnesty International. Amnesty, along with many other human rights organisations, journalists, unions, political groups around the world have spoken out about Julian Assange and their representative Christian is here today. Christian Lampong, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having this opportunity to speak on a very, very important occasion, um, which I think is not only an Australian opportunity to advocate for justice and freedom in the world. In a world, in a time when we feel there are a lot of features in terms of global interactions, in terms of the health of our common democracy and what we call shared values. I'll speak to three points and I'll reiterate our position under Julian Assange, which has been consistent, principled and never changing. As an individual, I have enjoyed and benefited from the protection of what I call a special country, Australia. I felt that these particular quality is something that should be enjoyed naturally by everyone, let alone an Australian citizen. And not to even say someone that has been demonized when they are supposed to be celebrated. I want all of you to know that it's not just an Australian cause. Julian Assange is a hero and he is a global hero that should be celebrated and the likes of people like Nelson Mandela in their own right and all other global advocates for justice and freedom yeah. 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 today as we celebrate and at the same time advocate for a very very serious cause um, it is important to first of all highlight the great things that this man has done. In our continuous effort to engage and to make a world a better place, one of the most challenging things in our time, both as politicians, as individuals, as civil society activists, is the moral courage to speak truth to power. And that is what we do at Amnesty International. Julian Assange, like just so many others, lines in the category of victims of power that consider journalism as a crime. Journalism shouldn't be a crime. It should be what we call the fourth power or the fourth arm of government. That should be the defining aspect of our democracy. Rather than being punished for that, I think we should erect a statue for Julian Assange. I am quite conscious of the fact that I do have three minutes. I wouldn't want to do dishonor to this very, very special advocacy effort. And I wouldn't want to do dishonor to his name. I would call on everyone, advocate to continue in the next six months, because what Julian Assange stands to face is something far more serious than the press tends to get attention. We can speak about this in our communities, in our churches, wherever that we think that the urge for freedom is something that is valued. And I would conclude by emphasizing that the position that we hold is not a personal reflection. The United Nations, which represents the states and the nations of the world, has clearly made a declaration to the effect that 
keeping Julian Assange is a violation of his human rights. It goes clearly and glaringly against the optional protocol on torture and the treatment that Julian Assange is getting and is most likely to get should he be extradited to the US is going to be inhumane, degrading, and that's not something that Australia stands for. That's not something that the free world stands for. At a time when we face an assault to Ukraine, and at a time when we think that we need more powers of good to align, causes like this should be something that mobilize the efforts for good. So I would say free Julian Assange, and I would once more reiterate our collective will that the present government, in its declaration that it wouldn't use megaphone diplomacy, we just want to appeal whatever pressure, whatever patterns or whatever method this government seeks to use, we just want to invoke or reiterate to the government that the release of Assange, having a free man and a good free man is something that's not good just for Australia, but it's good for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I spy David Shoebridge, the new uh, Senator for New South Wales. Thank you very much, David. Thanks so much, Mary. And I acknowledge we're all gathered here today on Ngunnawal and Numbri land. We pay our collective respects to those elders past, present and emerging. And that place behind us has a huge job to walk with First Nations people and deliver truth, justice and land, doesn't it? But also I acknowledge the ongoing fight to bring an Australian citizen home. We have a new parliament and a new chance to stand up and have this government say no Australian citizen should face over a century in jail for the crime of telling the truth. Yeah. That is the... Yeah. Yeah. I find it astounding the way in which our government has been complicit in the ongoing persecution of one of our citizens. A, a, a citizen journalist whose crime was exposing the war crimes of the United States and the war crimes of one of our allies in wars which we were involved as well. Without Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, we would not know the truth. And it's the truth that is really at risk with this prosecution of Julian Assange. This isn't against Julian Assange. This is an effort by the US government with the complicity of our government. It's a war against the truth and we should call it out for what it is. And the truth matters. And the truth matters. And if our Prime Minister is going to stand up for that basic principle that the truth matters. Well, then he should pick up the phone and he should use the diplomatic power we have with the UK and the US and he should best say to both of those governments, drop the prosecution and bring Julian home. So I know you've heard contributions from my Greens colleagues, Jordan and Pete, and I've got to say I've, I've watched their ongoing work in this place, not letting this issue be dropped. And I'm grateful for their work, and I'm grateful for their advocacy. But I can tell you as I look around this crowd, I am grateful that there are so many Australians who care about this. I'm grateful that you've come down here to Canberra in the first week of this new parliament and made sure that Julian Assange and the truth is on the table in the first week of this parliament. So I can tell you this as a Greens MP, and I'm the justice spokesman for the party, that we will not stop, we will not stop until our government steps up for Julian. We will not stop until our government steps up for the truth. And I want to come back here in a few short weeks or months and celebrate Julian Assange coming home, celebrate the truth and have a victory, have a victory for decency over war, for truth over lies and for citizens and the ability of citizens to learn the truth, to learn the truth because I see this as a very clear signal to anybody else in this planet, any one of us. If you stand out and call out the war crimes of the United States, if you stand up and call out the war crimes of Australia or the United Kingdom, after they come after Julian, they'll come after you. So this is a fight for the future, it's a fight for the truth, and I can tell you this, it's a fight we're going to win, we're going to bring Julian home. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, David.
Um, I'd like for a moment uh, to turn to the personal cost that Julian has paid for standing up for the truth and invites Dr Sue Wareham uh, to say a few words. Sue Wareham is part of the uh, Doctors for Assange group. There are over 300 of them now internationally uh, raising awareness of the great cost to Julian, to his health, to his personal life. Um, and I, yes, thank you very much, Sue. Hello to you all, and I would like to initially acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay respects of all of us to their elders past, present and future. It's a great honour to be here among you and to stand in solidarity with each of you and with the people, people in Parliament, with Julian Assange's supporters around the world and especially, of course, with Julian Assange himself because there are few people on the planet who are paying as heavy a price as he is for telling us things that we have a right to know, things that are done in our name. And as we all know, Julian has been detained for over three years in addition to his time in the Ecuadorian embassy. Much of his time has been in solitary confinement. He's been convicted of absolutely nothing and he is being persecuted because another country, the United States, wants to charge him on political charges. How can Australia credibly point to other nations and the war crimes that they commit when we allow treatment of a man like this who has simply exposed the crimes of our ally, the United States, in Iraq and elsewhere. Dr. Frisange, as Mary noted, um, has over 300 members um, around the world uh, who are increasingly concerned about the state of Julian's, uh, Julian's health, both physical and mental especially since his reported mini-stroke in October last year. With a history of prolonged exposure to psychological torture and now a planned extradition to a country which is virtually a... which is totally ramping up the prospects of suicide, then what's desperately needed now is proper attention to independent, independent attention to health care, proper health care, to protect his future and his health. Dr. Frisange wrote to the United, K United Kingdom Home Secretary in June. It was the latest in a series of letters to all the three governments involved, stating clearly that his deteriorating health must be considered in her decision, Pretty Patel's decision, regarding extradition, and the letter stated in part, under conditions in which the UK legal system has failed to take Mr Assange's current health situation into account, no valid decision to approve his extradition can be made by you or anyone else. Well, that was all to no avail. The approval was granted despite his deteriorating health condition. We call yet again on the Australian Government to intervene without further delay. What more does it take for an Australian Government to act decisively to protect this Australian citizen who is a political prisoner who is in desperate need of protection? The message that the United States and the United Kingdom need to hear from Australia loudly and publicly, the messages are simple. Assange's life is at risk. Extradition for political charges is not acceptable. He must be released, he must not be extradited, and he must be brought home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, now, it's clear that administrations do intervene when they want to. This government has dropped the prosecution, the appalling prosecution, against Bernard Kaleri. The previous, the previous administration uh, decided not to pursue the ABC over their uh, stories based on material that was um, allegedly leaked by David McBride. However, 
the whistleblower is still being pursued. And I'd like to invite David Shoebridge to say just a few words about David McBride, who's with us here today. The main thing I wanted to do was acknowledge the presence of David McBride, an extremely brave whistleblower. David. And you don't have to go to London to find a government persecuting a whistleblower, because our government is doing it right here. What was David's crime? Crime? David's crime was blowing the whistle on war crimes in Afghanistan by the Australian Armed Forces. And for that, he has been persecuted and continues to be persecuted by the, by the Australian government, by the former government. So we've seen one prosecution against a whistleblower get dropped. And if we care about the truth, not just about what the US does, but what about Australia does, well, collectively, let's make the same demand to drop the prosecution against David and to drop the prosecution against the truth. So can we just collectively give a big cheer and shout and thanks to David for the bravery of telling the truth, knowing full well what would come against him. David, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we have uh, messages from Julian Hill, from John Shipton and Gabriel Shipton, but before we go to the messages, I'd like to invite uh, our final speaker here today, and that's James Rickardson. James has been a political prisoner himself. Uh, he knows uh, the price that you pay uh, when you are imprisoned for uh, well, the wrong reason, for no reason in his case. Um, James has written countless letters to Australian Prime Ministers, Foreign Ministers, uh, the American President, um, and I don't know that he's received a single reply. <coughs> when I was arrested in 2017 in Cambodia and charged with espionage, it so happened that in the cell that I was sharing with 140 other prisoners, a cell less than a third the size of a, a, size of a tennis court, there was a, a contraband smartphone and it was possible for me to make contact with Julian in the Ecuadorian embassy. Within an hour, I got a res response from Julian and some advice on how best to deal with my incarceration. I won't go into details about that, but I, I have a, a personal reason, of course, for being thankful to Julian for being so quick off the mark in helping me. But I have a professional reason also because I realised at that time that if in 2010 I, as a journalist and filmmaker, had been presented with the material that he was presented with, I would have had no hesitation whatsoever in broadcasting it, in including it in a, in a, a film that I was making, in writing about it on a blog and could very easily have found myself in exactly the same situation that Julian is in now. I think the same probably applies to most of the filmmakers and journalists that I know. Jump forward 12 years and I would have some hesitation in making that move, in making that information public because I would not want to spend the next 10 years fighting extradition proceedings to be sent to the United States for having exposed um, truths that the United States doesn't want to be exposed. I'd like to just say a couple of words about consular assistance. Um, this expression crops up all of, all of the time. Our Prime Minister, our Foreign Minister and various different politicians say that Julian is receiving consular assistance. I can assure you from my own experience in jail that con consular assistance amounts to, in my case, a toothbrush and a paperback book, out-of-date um, copies of local newspapers and the delivery of mail. And that is it, right? Consular, consular assistance does not exist in reality and I think that anybody else who's been in my situation could um, confirm that. Just briefly, there was a, another prisoner in jail with me. His name was um, Giuseppe Nicolosi. We called him Zippy. Zippy was in the final months of his um, three-year, sorry, seven-year uh, sentence, based on evidence that was as flimsy as mine, in my case. 
Zippy became very, very ill. We in jail got messages to the Australian Embassy, many messages, um, via this mobile phone, this contraband mobile phone, alerting the Embassy to the fact that Zippy was very unwell and getting worse and needed to be in a hospital. He needed to be airlifted back to Australia, actually, to be in an intensive care ward. The Australian Embassy said it wasn't their problem, it's nothing that they could do about it. And to cut a long story short, Zippy died of malnutrition and neglect in a, a hospital where he was, re he, he was taken to the hospital a day before he died, two days before he died. That is the extent to which our government assists Australians who get into trouble, whether they be Julian Assange or a, a backpacker. The final, the final point that I'd like to make has to do with um, diplomatic intervention. In my own case, um, after 15 months in jail, I was found guilty of espionage and sentenced to six years, a six-year jail sentence. Three weeks later, the guards appeared at my door and told me that I was being released immediately. When I got out of jail, I discovered shortly thereafter that Malcolm Turnbull, our then Prime Minister, had done a deal with Hun Sen, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, whereby I'd be taken to trial and then released on a pardon after my trial. In other words, our Prime Minister agreed with Cambodia's Prime Minister that I would be found guilty, there was no question that I might be found innocent, and that I would then receive a pardon. My concern now is that a similar kind of deal might occur behind the scenes, whereby it appears as though the Australian government is doing the right thing by Julian, but in actual fact he spends the next two, three, four or five years waiting for the pardon to come through, which really needs to come through immediately. Finally, I have actually written yesterday and this morning to um, President Joe Biden and to Carolyn Kennedy, our new ambassador, the US's new ambassador to, to Australia, and through the magic of Google I've managed to find the words of both Joe Biden and John F. Kennedy, Carolyn Kennedy's father, in which, and you can Google them and find them yourself, uh, in which they espouse the very same values that Julian espouses as a journalist, and yet he is in jail for articulating the need for freedom of, uh, sorry, freedom of the press, for freedom of information, for the public to be informed about what goes on behind the scenes, even if it is embarrassing to the government's concerned. So, m along with everybody else here today, I hope that um, Anthony Albanese can pick up the phone and say to Joe, I know it's difficult for you politically, it's difficult for me politically also, but this is a matter of principle and we need to put politics aside and send Julian back to his family and back to Australia. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, we're now going to hear a message from Julian's brother, Gabriel Shipton. Gabriel and his father, John, have been travelling the world, uh, raising awareness of Julian's plight, uh, Julian's health. And following that, we'll hear from Julian Hill, who wanted to be with us today, but couldn't get away from government business up on the hill. Uh, and then finally, Catherine Kelly from the Alliance Against Political Prosecutions. For the past month and a half, John Shipton, Julian's dad and I have been on the road advocating for Julian's release. We started in the USA where we met with civil society groups who have been calling on the Biden administration to drop the charges against Julian because of the threat they pose to press freedom. Similarly, in Washington DC, we met with Congress people, both Republican and Democrat, who see the threat that Julian's per prosecution means to their First Amendment and their democratic rights. In Germany, we met with a cross-party group that includes parliamentarians from every major German political party. Over 90 German parliamentarians are now calling for Julian Assange to be released. We even met with the German Foreign Ministry. We met with the State Minister there, who's the second in charge after the Foreign Minister. So Germany are very concerned, even the German government 
are very concerned about the threat. Julian Assange's prosecution means to their journalists. In the UK, we have traveled all around the country with Stella Assange, Julian's wife, as we did Q and A screenings with the film Ithaca. That's about John and Stella's fight to free Julian. We screened a film and spoke to people in Norwich, in Liverpool, in Manchester, in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, in Exeter, all over the UK. We spoke to thousands of people, all concerned about what's going on and the persecution of Julian Assange. There is a global wave of support for Julian that just keeps growing and growing and growing. And everyone here today is part of that wave. Next week, John and I will be in Canberra and we will be asking the government to really step up their calls for Julian Assange to be released and for the Biden administration to drop the charges. The Alliance Against Political Prosecutions is appalled at the treatment of award-winning journalist Julian Assange. It is clear that Julian Assange did not commit espionage. He published material provided to him about war crimes committed in Iraq in 2010, about Guantanamo Bay, Afghanistan, and other things we had a right to know about. What else could he have done? Surely we don't encourage people to keep silent about crimes. But since publication, he has suffered extreme persecution. With the time in the Ecuadorian embassy, and in Belmarsh Prison, where he remains to this day, it is close to 10 years that he has not seen freedom. He has suffered isolation, deteriorating physical and mental health, and torture as assessed by the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Melzer. For a man not convicted of any crime, this is extreme injustice and inhumanity, which is clearly seriously adversely affecting his health. Julian's prosecution is a great danger to press freedom and human rights everywhere. The assurances given by the US government about his treatment in US prisons cannot be relied upon and should not be relied upon since he has not committed any crime. We urge Prime Minister Albanese to put an end to this persecution of an innocent, courageous man and to speak loudly and clearly to the UK and US governments to free Julian and drop all the charges. If the friendship between our countries cannot stand that, what is it worth? Julian Assange must be free. Thank you, Julian Hill, for coming to The Hill. Can you answer a few questions about Julian Assange. The first question that I would have for you is in relation to the letter sent by doctors for Assange, which is a group of over 300 doctors now, to the UK Home Secretary, Priti Patel, pointing out that we have a problem now with the US assurances. They were made, the doctors say, in relation to a prior health condition, which was mental health, and since then, on the 27th of October, he had a minor stroke. And the doctors are all saying that this is more often than not a sign that a major one is on the way. This has never been discussed in the courts, and even though it happened when he was attending his appeal. He was in Belmarsh Prison, but I'm pretty sure they had view on him. And Mary Kostakidis and I saw him. All of the journalists had view on him. So... This is a real problem because one of the expert witnesses, Yancey Ellis, said that in the William G. Truesdale Alexandria Adult Detention Centre, or ADC, where Ellis said Julian will most likely go, there are no doctors and no real medical facility. While one of the doctors for Assange, former surgeon, Dr. Arthur of Chesterfield Evans, said that if he has a major stroke, he will need, and Jill Stein backed that up, also a general practitioner, that he will need emergency room treatment for a very dangerous and delicate procedure within three hours. Now, if Julian is locked up for 22 hours a day in isolation and he has this stroke, he may not even have a chance of being discovered. 
And according to Dr. Arthur Chesterfield Evans, after four and a half hours, it's really not worth it. There would be no chance of recovery. What are we going to do about this situation, Julian? Um, look, thanks, Cathy. And I want to thank everyone who continues to speak up for Julian Assange uh, and defend the principles that we're fighting for. In particular, speaking up for press freedom and pushing back on uh, what this is a blatant attempt to do, which is a chill the free press. Um, I also want to acknowledge the many community activists, community leaders and community organisations that continue to put in effort around Australia, but in other Western democracies. And the efforts of the 300 doctors. I received that material some weeks ago and uh, have forwarded it on uh, within the government. It is deeply concerning. And I, like many Australians, were appalled at the British court's decision to approve extradition overturning the initial decision and deeply disappointed, though sadly not surprised, uh, by Priti Patel, the UK Home Secretary's approval of the extradition. Extradition is always, in democratic systems, a political judgment to make ultimately. And extradition, in my view, a principled view, should not be approved for what are inherently political crimes. Um, they're matters of um, principle, which I've stated before. Um, now, I understand the reasons from speaking to his legal team why Julian has to date rejected consular assistance from the Australian government. Um, it may be time um, that that position is reconsidered because it is frankly very difficult for the government of Australia to get involved in these issues and try and seek assurances and push for assurances around health issues when consular assistance has been rejected. I'm not meaning that to be an inflammatory comment, it's just a statement of fact. And I do understand why to date that consular assistance has not been taken up and why there hasn't been trust in that process. But the medical evidence is deeply worrying about his current health conditions and it would be appropriate for the government, should we be allowed to do so under the consular assistance banner, to get involved and seek greater assurances around the conditions in which he's currently being kept uh, and any future conditions around medical treatment. That's what I'd like to see. Um, I'm sorry, to be clear, what I would like to see is the prosecution dropped, um, extradition not approved and the matter brought to a close. And the Australian government has been clear before and since the election that the case has dragged on for long enough and that the matter should be brought to a close. They were words enough is enough that the now Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, have used before the election. Uh, and we continue, um, so I'm assured, to express the government's view to the UK and the US about our position. Thank you, Julian Hill. My second question concerns an article in Declassified Australia by the lawyer Kelly Tranto, who submitted freedom of information request to the Attorney General Department. And she received documents regarding a prisoner transfer protocol. There was a lot of stuff that was redacted in what she was handed back. And that was in relation to key risks and mitigations. What we could see there really principally concerned what happens after Julian is extradited, goes through perhaps 10 years of the appeals process. And finally, we don't want this to happen, but if he gets convicted, then there is some kind of loose agreement that he would be allowed to apply to serve a sentence in Australia, where America would dictate how long he is imprisoned here. Now, we are very concerned about what's hidden behind this black rectangle of redaction. The question that Kelly Tranter poses is she would hope that one of the key risks is suicide. In fact, that's the one that she draws attention to. She also puts in a quotation from Professor Koppelman, who was one of the expert witnesses for the defence. He's a world-renowned psychiatrist, and so was another one, Professor Quentin Dealey. However, there were two other expert witnesses on the prosecution side, and all four were in agreement that Assange presented a moderate to high risk of suicide, not in the US, but in the UK. What was stated in the quotation from Koppelman, and this is something that I've been aware of because, and Mary Kostakidis as well, because we have been in the courtroom for the last two years. We remember very clearly this being said, and this troubling me for some time, that once Julian's extradition 
became imminent. Imminent. He would find a way to complete his suicide. And this view was accepted by the magistrate, Vanessa Barreto, from the lower court. Now, the problem is, and Kelly Tranter points out, that because these assurances are about conditions in the United States, they are immaterial if he's going to commit suicide in the UK, if he never makes it out of there. So what can we do about this? Oh, oh sorry, I'd just like to add something to that. There is an application to the Office of the Information Commissioner to have the redacted material released. Now, one reason that I think that that should be approved is that how can we have a guarantee, given the complexity of this case, its duration, the avalanche of misinformation that has surrounded Julian and the case for the last 10 years, how can we be confident, we as journalists who are pretty well expert in the case now, how can we be confident that our diplomats have been well or accurately informed about this? Shouldn't the Office of the Information Commissioner say yes to scrutiny, even if it's by a limited number of people who are given clearance for that purpose? Just to make sure, just to do the fact checking, that's all. Mm. Um, the reports regarding Julian's health and the concerns, professional concerns by multiple psychiatrists now regarding his welfare and potential suicide, um, suicidal ideation, or indeed um, actions, are gravely concerning. Um, they're concerning, I think, to any decent human being and caring Australian, and also I know of concern within the government. Um, to be clear again, I don't want to see him extradited. I want to see this prosecution dropped. And the Australian government wants to see this matter brought to a close. That's our firm position. Um, as I noted earlier, there's limits to the extent to which we can engage in detail on his behalf in relation to health and consular concerns, given he's refused consular assistance. And I understand the reasons for that. Um, and there are limits at this stage in a legal sense, because Australia and the Australian government are not parties to the case. That's just a fact. It's not an avoidance of responsibility statement. I'm not trying to avoid um, the question, but it's also a fact that the Australian government is not a party to the case and that ultimately we can make representations as we have, but we cannot force or stop the extradition or the prosecution. Um, that goes to diplomatic efforts and so on. Um, look, with regard to those documents, I had a look at them. I thought that um, much of the article and analysing the context was very robust. I thought some of the framing was probably a little bit a um, little bit over the top, and it's entirely normal that documents are released according to the FOI laws. My overriding concern is that those decisions are made according to the law and are made promptly and quickly um, and don't drag on for months or years, as we've seen too often with the former government. Yeah. Could you be a little bit more specific about what bring this matter to a close actually means? There's multiple ways. As I've uh, Maybe I'll reference some of the media reporting that I've seen, um, which I think is well covered it. Um, and as I've said, I would like to see the UK um, decline the extradition and not agree to extradite him. Um, and I would like to see the US drop the prosecution. Um, there's multiple ways in which that could happen. And as I said, this is an unfortunately realist observation and it's not a new observation. There are observations that are made in speeches before the election in media interviews and in our private discussions within the parliament. I think this is recognised. Australia is not a party to the case. And ultimately, we cannot force the UK or the US to cease the trajectory that they're on. We can try, but we can't force it. They're just facts. Um, now, I understand and I've seen the community commentary that would like the Prime Minister to speak more publicly about um, the, the contents of his private conversations and efforts. Um, I've seen um, many people would like us all to scream from the rooftops. I think it's entirely appropriate that people are gathering outside the parliament that around the country we continue to see um, week after week people coming, taking to the streets, standing outside government buildings, speaking up in the press in favour of Assange. I really do. Um, I also think it's appropriate, um, given we know the Prime Minister's position on this issue, he's been clear internally and externally. I also think it's appropriate and I trust his judgment about the best way to prosecute these things. And his judgment at the moment is that quiet diplomacy making clear our position to partners and allies around the world and other governments is the most likely way to achieve a result. Um, now, 
I won't put words in the Prime Minister's mouth. I want to be really clear that's not what I'm doing. But I have seen a number of media reports in recent weeks, which I think had a lot to offer in terms of insight into the difficulties and the barriers, particularly within the US system. Um, I think you've made the point, Cathy, quite rightly, that this is a political case. It's a political decision to extradite. And we've conveyed our view to the UK government regarding that. Um, and it's also a political decision in the US and a highly politically charged matter. Um, there was some sensible, I think, media commentary over the last few weeks identifying difficulties or barriers or roadblocks that make this case particularly um, tricky to resolve within the US in the short term. Um, one is President Biden's stated priority on leaving the Justice Department to be independent. And so there's a very high threshold, if you like, for him to jump to intervene, given his public statements on many other matters, for him to just direct the Justice Department to drop a prosecution. Again, that's a fact which has been reported by pretty credible analysts, and I think we should give it weight and understand that given the political rhetoric that President Biden has put around not behaving like President Trump and making political interventions in prosecutions, that's a difficulty which needs to be resolved. And I think the Australian government's judgment is probably right from what I can see from the outside that difficulty or delicacy may not be aided by loud, screechy diplomacy. Um, the other observation that's been made, again, by I think it was Joe Hockey as the former ambassador and a number of sort of Washington um, uh, literate people, far more than you and I, Cathy, is the timing is always an issue with these things and that the midterm elections are coming up. There's very strongly held views about Julian um, down on Capitol Hill. And those much wiser and closer than you and I have observed that the timing question would also be delicate before the midterms. And the third, the third observation I'd make, and I'm someone who's made the point repeatedly, that Chelsea Manning, the person who leaked the classified documents, was pardoned, had her sentence commuted, whereas Assange has now been incarcerated for longer. I would observe also, uh, as the media have said, that her sentence was commuted after a legal process and a guilty prosecution. And that's a view which some parts of the US establishment we've seen in public reports and um, dispatches uh, in the media have been raising as well. So I think those, those issues give you a sense of some of the barriers. And again, I just need to be clear, I'm not party to the discussions. I'm not a member of the cabinet. I'm a backbencher with a set of principal views. Um, but I think that some of the media reporting there has pointed to some of the difficulties and probably starts to make sense of why the Prime Minister's taken the view that this is best prosecuted in the way he's doing so, to leave the American system maximum room to move and to close in answer to your question. Therefore, there's a number of ways that this matter could be brought to a close, Cathy, but they're not within our control. Yeah, well, timing is pretty sensitive. It's been a decade. Indeed. And we were just quite worried that he may not last for that much longer. He's very frail. And there's another upsurge of more dangerous COVID in the UK. No, it's horribly concerning. The media reports, the health reports, the assessment by the doctors is horribly concerning and underscores the urgency um, of bringing this matter to a close and releasing him from incarceration in those conditions. That's what I want to hear, that that's how we bring it to a close. <laughs> that's my view, Cathy, very clearly. <laughs> I get it, Julian. You're probably the person who's the most well informed about Julian's case. Look, I just I'd maybe you know I've used a lot of words there. I'll just sort of sum it up in in simple terms. Um, many of us feel so strongly about this issue um, in civil society and in the parliament, and certainly the Labor caucus. And resolving it is not fully within our power. That's just the fact of life. I wish it were. I wish it were. Um, mm. And. Those barriers, which I've tried to point to in a sort of a measured, thoughtful way, because I've been giving this a lot of thought you know, with others working on the campaign. What are the barriers? What could we do as a global community? People working in other countries. I've had discussions with people from the UK and elsewhere. What could we do to try and resolve some of those questions? And you know, people who've thought about this deeply have observed there are real barriers in the Justice Department intervention issue, um, in the issue about pardons versus commutes versus dropping sentences, and of course, with the timing of the midterms. This is all caught up in the US political system. I wish it were otherwise. Um, so sometimes these things become a question of approach and timing. I was just wondering um, 
have you seen what's behind those rectangles of redaction? Have you any knowledge of what's been said? Just no, because no. I wondered if one of the key risks with Julian is that he would go back to work and start revealing things again. <laughs> as, as you've heard me say before in answer to questions like that, Kathy, I'm not doing hypotheticals and I'm not going to speculate. I have no knowledge. No, you haven't seen um, it. Okay. Can I, just, can I just make one other point from a former life as a public servant that um, from the outside there's often conspiracy theory or innocence or stuff up and I've found in life you're always better to back innocence or stuff up because conspiracy theory is very, very rare. Um, I, I do have, and I'll put this on the record, I do have great faith from all of my dealings over many years now with the professionalism of the Department of Foreign Affairs and the insight and intelligence that they bring to their task. Um, and I mean that that in, in the broadest sense of intelligence, um, in every sense. So I've got no reason to doubt that the advice they're giving is the best that they can possibly give. Well, based on the information that they've been given, and that's one of my Indeed. concerns, that they may have been yeah. misled. Um, we don't know and we can't know unless the Office of Information Commissioner will agree to let at least some people see and fact check what's in there. Can I just move to the US now? So there's a, almost a ray of sunshine here. There have been some proposed changes to the Espionage Act by squad members Rashida Talib and Ilan Omar. And these changes limit who the Espionage Act applies to. It's basically government employees who have signed a contract or an oath that they are not allowed to tell certain information is secret and they engage legally to keep it a secret, but not journalists. So this is one of the changes. And there is another clause that reason to believe is changed to you must have specific intent to harm national security. And the most interesting one I find is that information must have been properly classified. Now, under Obama's executive order of 2009, it's executive order 13526, section 1 1.7, it is illegal to classify anything that conceals violations of law, inefficiency or administrative error, uh, or which just simply prevents embarrassment to a person or organization or agency, or even to prevent the release of information needlessly in a so-called interest of national security. In accordance with this law, Tlaib proposes an affirmative public interest defence for the purpose of disclosing misdeeds to the public. The Espionage Act is currently a matter of strict liability, but we can't assume that everyone behind closed doors is innocent or simply incompetent. Now, my goodness, there's only two of them so far, unless there's a, a few more that have joined. But that last one about information being properly classified, there is a problem of overclassification. Two, in fact, one that there is far too much that is classified, and the other one is that WikiLeaks actually did pick the things that that's what they published, stuff that was mainly illegally classified. What do you think about this? And how can we actually promote the idea? I know it's an American question, but would the Australian government make representations that they straighten out their Espionage Act to stop charging journalists? Because journalists would not be charged under these new amendments. Yeah, I, uh, I'm no expert on the US espionage or legal framework. And as I think you implicitly acknowledged there, um, the Australian um, lawmaking system, um, intelligence architecture and legislative architecture and indeed the laws themselves are fundamentally different from the US system. Um, they're a, a presidential system with two co-branches of government, hence a lot of the legislative architectures just fundamentally different because it also goes to the relationship between Congress and the administration. Um, so I, I don't think I'm in a position to comment on in any great detail and um, it would be highly unusual for the Australian government to be advocating specific legal changes one way or the other or getting involved in the legislative system of another country. Are we going that way too, though, in, you know, being too draconian about what people are entitled to know? Well, I think, as I said before, um, there's a freedom of information regime in Australia, which Labor put in place. 
Um, we've been very critical in opposition regarding the resourcing in particular and the time taken to make those decisions. Yeah. And I'd hope to see that we can make prompter, fairer decisions. Um, there will always be things, this is, should not be a radical statement, particularly in the security area that we're living through. Um, threats of terrorism and so on are not, are not fantasies of the intelligence agencies, sadly, as we've seen so often in the world. Um, they're real. There will always be things um, that cannot be revealed publicly. There will always be a need for some government secrets. Um, the question, of course, is where you draw that line and making sure that things are done according to the law that applies. Um, so I think that our commitment to making the FOI regime work is important, um, as is strong and uh, ongoing oversight of the intelligence agencies in the security sector. Um, in that regard, Australia's intelligence, um, the IGES, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, is a critical institution uh, with the powers of a standing royal commission to oversight those agencies. And to date, I think the appointments to that position have been exemplary. Um, as is the commitment to the independent national security legislation monitor, um, which again is something that the former government questioned and there were moves to try and wind back or use that office um, and that we're committed to. Um, you can see in our national platform and uh, the bills in previous parliaments introduced by Penny Wong and others of a commitment to robust oversight of the intelligence agencies and that'll continue. Thank you very much, Julian Hill.